Good evening and welcome to the Royal Irish Academy. My name is Orla McBride and I'm the director of the National Archives and I want to welcome the 300 virtual viewers who are joining us from across the globe this evening. This is the final pan panel discussion in our 2021 uh, commemorations programme which will culminate on the 6th of December with the opening of our exhibition, the Treaty 1921 Records from the Archives, marking the centenary of the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty. This exhibition presented at the Coach House in Dublin Castle is presented in partnership with the Royal Irish Academy, the OPW, the National Library of Ireland, and our content partners, UCD Archives and the Military Archives. The Treaty 1921 records from the archives opens up significant historical records, official documents and private papers for the first time, including the treaty document itself. Using contemporary reportage, images and footage, the exhibition locates the treaty negotiations in the political context of the Irish Revolution and a world turned upside down by the First World War. Beginning with the exploratory talks between Eamon de Valera, President of Dáil Éireann, and the British Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, during the summer of 1921, it details the work of the Irish plenipotentiaries and their secretariat by presenting the documentary record that they left behind. The exhibition also chronicles day-to-day -day life in London for the men and women who made up the Irish delegation from parties attended, dinners hosted, and appearances at theatre and gala performances, to the tense final days and hours leading up to the signing of the treaty just after 2 a.m. on the 6th of December, 1921. Finally, it documents the international response to the treaty, as well as the delegation's return to Dublin and the Dáil Éireann cabinet meeting that signalled the split in the independence movement that emerged over the terms of the treaty and the divisions that would lead to the civil war. And so in many ways, this evening is a natural conclusion to our panel events this autumn. The Irish Revolution and the making of a new order, what the archives tell us. We return this evening to the authenticity of the archival record to understand the world in 1921 and how the men and women involved in the revolution and post-treaty period spoke to and engaged with ideas of women's equality, race, democracy and the politics of social and economic transformation that were sweeping the world at this time. And so to present our panel. Unfortunately, Dr. Brian Hanley can't join us this evening, but we have with us Professor Linda Connolly, who's Professor of Sociology at Maynooth University. Um, and she has, has uh, led the IRC funded project on women and the Irish Revolution. And the outputs included the new book, Women and the Irish Revolution, Feminism, Activism and Violence. Professor Fergal McGarry is Professor of Modern Irish History at Queen's University Belfast and has led the major AHRC funded project on a global history of the Irish Revolution. So I'm going to hand over now to our chair, Dr. Patrick Gagan, who's Professor of Modern History in Trinity College, Dublin. Patrick's an expert in the British-Irish relationship in the late 18th and 19th century, as well as on the competing themes of constitutional nationalism and republicanism. So I think no better man to steer the discussion here this evening. I'll hand over now to Patrick to chair the discussions. Well, thank you very much, Orla, and good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to be here for this uh, National Archives event, uh, remembering the events of 100 years ago, putting them in a global context, and also uh, looking at the archives and exploring what the archives tell us. And two uh, very distinguished uh, scholars here, Professor Linda Connolly and Professor Fergal McGarry, and they're going to give short uh, overviews or introductions uh, to uh, their work, some of the ideas that they're exploring. And then we're going to have a, a discussion for about 20, 25 minutes, and then we're going to open it up to questions from our audience, both our audience uh, here in the Royal Irish Academy and also uh, you watching at home and online. So uh, we've had an, an introduction uh, to our two very distinguished guests. And Linda, we might begin with you and uh, your thoughts and maybe setting the, the scene for uh, some of the issues that we're discussing. 
Thank you. So um, it's lovely to be here and hello to everybody online as well in this uh, new uh, world that we're living in. Um, so it's, it's lovely to be here and thank you for joining us. Um, and thank you as well uh, to the National Archives for the invitation. So I, I'll say a little bit about my work first, uh, just to give you a, a general idea of, of the kind of work I've been doing for uh, over 20 years now at this stage. And most of my work really focuses on uh, the relationship between gender and revolution. And a lot of that early work was on the role of the women's movement in Irish society over a very long period, from the 1860s right up to as near the present as I could back in the 1990s when after Mary Robinson was elected. And I think there's a very interesting interplay around the notion of gender and revolution. And the, th the title of my book, which, which Orla, the edited collection uh, on women in the Irish Revolution, has three words, feminism, activism, and violence. So in a way, I started with the feminism all that time ago. And I think one of the important outcomes of not just the recent work on the revolution that we've seen as a consequence of the decade of commemorations uh, is that feminism is a very important aspect uh, of this period. Uh, in, uh, and is, I think, uh, a, a intrinsically connected to, first of all, what the revolution did, because uh, many of the activists moved across the various movements, socialist, socialism, republicanism, uh, labor causes, and feminism. So it's an integral aspect uh, of the revolution, not just in Ireland, but globally. Uh, but secondly, it's also deeply connected to the outcome. Uh, of the revolution, uh, it, which we are discussing tonight. So, so I think it's very important to put feminism into the centre uh, of the analysis, and we'll be talking a little bit about that. The second part, activism, uh, is also very important because what we have witnessed, I think, particularly since Margaret Ward published her book uh, in the 1980s, uh, Unmanageable Revolutionaries, it's just been republished, which is wonderful, uh, with a new chapter, bringing us right up to the troubles. Um, but the activism part really is, I suppose, what a lot of the, what we call in women's history and gender studies, the recovery work uh, has looked at for the past 30 to 40 years. So for instance, the role of women uh, organizing in Common Amman has really uh, gone through a, a, a process of recovery work. And uh, there is, a, a, I suppose, a, a, a literature now on what women did, the activism, but not just Common Amman, uh, as I mentioned, the feminist organizations uh, and so forth. We also have um, a literature on uh, women who were involved in unionism and, and loyalism as well. So you have that activism as the second part. And, and women were extremely, extremely active. One of the um, important outcomes of the new sources, which we'll be talking about in a moment, is that we have a really now a deep sense, a very uh, almost intimate understanding of what women did as activists, the risks they took. And the idea that, you know, that, that the women were somehow engaged in less risky activity um, or that they were, you know, um, less, I suppose, damaged by the violence that occurred has really been revised, has undergone a process of, of, of revisionism. And I say that with a small or, I don't mean it in, in, that, in, the, in terms of how uh, the nationalist revisionist debate uh, evolved in the 80s. And then thirdly, and what I'll really be focusing on this evening, uh, the violence. And I think, um, so I have done a lot of work in recent years building on the earlier work uh, of colleagues, people like Louise Ryan, who published an article in 2000 uh, with this, the, uh, the subtitle Drunken Towns. And I think, you know, if you think of popular memory, I remember my own grandmother saying when the Black and Towns came along, she said, we used to jump in the ditch. And, uh, and I, at the time, you know, that didn't really resonate with me. I just thought, gosh, that must have been awful. But now, looking back on it and having looked at um, the archives and the question of the impact of the revolution mm. uh, on women, I can see that was almost a pseudonym for, 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 for the fear of being attacked, you know, for the fear um, of the black and tans. It wasn't just something that was done for kind of fun. Um, it was um, a threat, that feeling of threat and fear. So, so the violence of the revolution is the third piece. And 
it's very interesting because when we talk about the violence that women experienced in the revolution, we then bring into the analysis or the frame the idea that violence can be gendered. And we know in the Irish Revolution that more men were killed than women. And a lot of the uh, historiography in recent decades has looked at uh, those who were killed you know, in combat uh, and less so at the experience of women because I suppose you know, being dead was considered the, which, you know, the, the, the kind of lethal violence. Um, but what has been rediscovered in recent years has been that there were specific forms of vi violence targeted at women that can tell us an awful lot, first of all, about the nature of the revolution itself, and secondly, about the ways in which perhaps the Irish Revolution was less exceptional uh, than other wars, conflicts. So one of the issues, for instance, is the, during the War of Independence, in particular by both sides, uh, the, the perpetration of forced hair cutting, for instance, mm. seems to have been widely used in a very planned way. Now, I'll, I can talk a bit more about that later, but that was one example. But secondly, and just very briefly before I sum up, in terms of, uh, we were asked to pick out some sources uh, from the National Archives collection. And secondly, I suppose, uh, the, the other kinds of violence uh, that women experienced in this period has recently come to the fore, particularly very difficult or taboo questions around more transgressive forms of violence, such as sexual violence, which is, I suppose, one of the more difficult questions and aspects of the past. We know um, that uh, sexual violence is, in many conflicts over time, a weapon of war. Uh, we know it is perpetrated uh, in different forms. Um, in some conflicts, it is, I suppose, a, a used as, as a mass-based um, form of violence against women. But I suppose in the Irish case, again, it was presumed that this didn't happen, that Ireland was the exception. And yet we know in recent years there are examples and cases um, of this. So the two I picked out from the archives were, first of all, in 1922, um, of what we call gender-based violence, the first uh, being referred to as, it's called the Ken Mayer incident. And it's uh, widely reflected in the Niall Harrington papers. And that's just one of the ones um, that, that I picked out. And it, 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 I suppose what is really interesting about looking at gender-based violence as well is, is that you can't blame any one side. It seems to cut across the hierarchies, so to speak, of conflict. So the, the Ken Mayer incident is interesting uh, because it involved free state army violence. And it is a case of just what I described there uh, of, of two young girls uh, being doused in um, motor, motor grease, it said. There's different variations. It being very badly um, beaten. and motor oil, uh, if, you, uh, if you rub dirty oil in the hair, it, it leads to hair loss. So it's a form of forced hair cutting, so to speak, forced hair removal. And this was a very controversial case because the alleged perpetrators, if you like, went right to the heart of the state. So this wasn't the IRA, you know, it, it wasn't the Crown Forces, you know, in the, in the War of Independence. And it's very interesting to look at how the state grappled with violence towards women, if you like, within its own ranks and within the arms of the state. So I picked out some examples there from the Harrington Papers, uh, which contain uh, a number of documents uh, in relation to the Ken Mayer incident. And others have written quite a bit about this, Dominic Price, um, Podrick O'Keeve and others. It's, there's quite a rich literature on that incident now. But it is an example of gender-based violence, what I'm talking about. And then secondly, very quickly, um, I, uh, I, ha I refer to uh, another document which might seem unrelated completely to what we're talking about tonight because it's a will from 1951 the will of Eileen Mary Warburton Biggs. And that's another case, uh, again, a, a, a really um, a traumatic incident that occurred in 1922 in the Drummond area. The, the, both of these cases are in, in June 1922, but um, 
uh, Eileen was gang raped. And again, it's a very, um, you know, specific incident that occurred, but she was a Protestant woman. So the, the, the two girls in, in Kerry were two Catholic women. Uh, Eileen was a Protestant woman, and this was uh, local IRA members. Uh, so, so the will of Eileen shows that she died in 1951 in St. Patrick's Hospital. And one of the themes that I'm interested in is we look at what happened to women during the revolution, but actually in order to understand that, we also have to look at after the revolution. Um, terrible thing to say, when you're dead, you're dead. Um, but those who lived with the hidden injuries of the revolution into the 30s, the 40s and the 50s, there we can begin to get a deeper understanding of what happened in the revolution, what happened to women, um, and to ask, unfortunately, some of the more difficult questions about the trauma, the memory, and, and the silences uh, that occurred in that period. So that's really just a, a broad overview of the kinds of issues um, that I'll be discussing. Thank you. OK, well, some very interesting things there, Professor Linda Connolly. Thank you so much. Um, we'll move to Fergal now. And uh, I think even what we saw there with Linda was uh, uh, a different take on this whole idea of uh, the new order or, or that is being created out of the Irish Revolution and depths that perhaps haven't been explored or mm -hmm. considered before. Uh, Fergal? Yeah, I think that's right, um, Patrick. I think sometimes in the past we've maybe looked at the idea of the new order in, in too narrow a sense as being a political order. Mm -hmm. But what Linda's talking about is a new social order, a new moral order. And some of the things that I want to talk about in, in, in my remarks are about the idea of a new, a new political order, but in a broader sense, a new kind of ideological order because of the impact of the First World War and how that's transforming the world. So today's session is called um, The Irish Revolution and the Making of a New World Order. And I want to talk about how the international context shaped the settlements of 1920 and 1921, the Government of Ireland Act, um, which partitions Ireland, and the uh, uh, treaty which establishes the Irish Free State. And I think it's useful to think of these two pieces of legislation as connected, they're, they're, they're part of the one settlement. And uh, it, it strikes me that one of the most notable aspects of the centenary of the Easter Rising in 2016 was the extent to which, you know, it was really broadly understood that uh, the, that the rebellion was 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 a, a response to a wider international context, in particular uh, the First World War. You know, without without the war, a rising probably wouldn't have taken place. It certainly wouldn't have been put down in the in, in the same way that it was, and you wouldn't have had sort of popular republicanism emerging as a as a popular movement. But I'm I'm often struck how, particularly in terms of commemoration, but also I think the way we write the history of the the later years how that international background, the importance of that international context kind of fades a little bit into uh, the background from 1919 onwards. And I think one reason for this is that we, we think of the events of 1919 to 21 primarily as a, as a war of independence, you know, as a kind of a military uh, a conflict. And so our gaze is drawn to events within Ireland, military events by and large, ambushes and reprisals and so on. Um, and the way in which the wider world is being transformed and the impact that that is having in terms of what's happening in Ireland, I think can sort of fade into the, 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 the backdrop. So I, I'd argue it's more useful to think of the conflict as a revolutionary struggle rather than a, a military war. Um, that's no news to historians, but if you think about how we commemorate um, the, the period, I think we, we exaggerate the military um, dimension. So things like elections, mass mobilization, land agitation, uh, industrial um, strikes, uh, propaganda, revolutionary diplomacy. I think all of these were much more important than armed struggle um, in terms of shaping events in Ireland and, and the outcome of, of those events and how what was going on in Ireland was perceived by people outside Ireland, which I think is hugely um, important. So if we look at the pivotal events of January 1919 when Doyle Aaron was uh, established, the extent to which Republican strategy was based on political rather than armed stru struggle in, in, in retrospect is really um, striking. Uh, when the Doyle first meets, the revolutionary documents that are, that are put forward are remarkably outward looking. Um, the Irish Declaration of Independence, which is intended for a global as much as a local audience, uh, demands the recognition and support of every free nation in the world. The Doyle's message to the free nations calls on every free nation to support the Irish uh, Republic by recognising Ireland's national status and her rights to its vindication at the Peace Congress. 
So in other words, the Republican strategy um, for securing independence in January 1919, it's political, not, not military. Um, and, it's, and it really prioritizes international recognition as the, the key to securing um, independence uh, to, the, to, the, to the point even that I think the ambush at Solohead Beg that takes place um, on, on the same day that the Doyle first meets is seen as a, as a, as a, as a distraction and unwelcome to many Republicans at the time. So I think this represents a really important distinction from how independence was supposed to be achieved by the Irish party, which of course was an appeal to Westminster. You know, it was, Westminster was the final arbiter of when and how much freedom uh, Ireland would receive. Whereas what Republicans did is they opened up this route to independence, at least conceptually in terms of propaganda and, and struggle, that, that went around Britain and appealed to the world. And I think that's hugely uh, important that, that orienting itself towards the international community gives a kind of a strategy um, for achieving republic that in, in many respects is probably more achievable in 1919 than in 1916 when republicans were dismissed as rainbow chasers because the idea of a republic seemed you know pretty pretty kind of um, uh, quixotic so i think you know why you have these expectations um, is very much linked to the extent to which europe has been really rapidly transformed in the early months of, of 1919 with the collapse of almost all the great empires um, bar britain uh, and the emergence of, of Republican states as the sort of default political norm across much of Europe. And I mean, that's a really striking and rapid um, change. And I think in that context, uh, the appeal to the, to the peace conference um, that had declared its intention to organize the future of the nations of the world on the principle of government by consent of the government was astute propaganda, even if ultimately there was no prospect or very little prospect of the peace conference actually recognizing the Irish Republic. I just think it was, it was a, you know, in terms of propaganda and its political strategy, was very, very um, effective. So I, the picture shifts a little bit as we get to the summer of 1919. It's clear that Ireland isn't going to be recognized by the peace conference. And I think that's one of the reasons why the military dimension of the struggle in, back in Ireland becomes more important. But even so, I think the, the, the global and the political and the propaganda remain absolutely central um, all the way through. Thinking about, for example, the role of the diaspora in, in America and across the British Empire, the role of revolutionary uh, diplomacy um, and, 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 and propaganda. And I think it was this um, kind of the international leverage that came from these very political uh, and largely non-violent strategies, rather than the much more limited military pressure that the IRA could, could apply that placed the British government under um, you know, considerable pressure by the time you get to the truce of 1921. And I think that's demonstrated by one of the National Archives documents that I've highlighted tonight, which is Desmond Fitzgerald's report on propaganda from January 1921, which um, essentially outlines the success of Republican uh, propaganda, not least the Irish Bulletin, which is the sort of the newsletter that goes to journalists and newspapers across the world, and how this is shaping American and international press coverage of events um, in Ireland. And this document makes clear in particular how the death of hunger striker Terence McSweeney and coverage of the reprisals of the Black and Tans throughout 1920 had led to you know, incredibly sort of sympathetic international coverage of what's going on in Ireland um, and really damaged England's reputation um, uh, globally. And I think it's the condemnation of reprisals in Britain and internationally that helps to explain why, despite the increasing success of the British government's counter-insurrectionary um, campaign, uh, David Lloyd George's government agrees to negotiate with the leaders of a movement which it had been denouncing just a few months before as, as, a, as a murder gang. Um, and I think if we, we move towards the settlement, uh, which uh, the partition settlement of 1920 and the 1921 treaty, I think they're very clearly shaped by international pressures and also imperial um, calculations. So the fateful decision, for example, to, to set up a Northern Ireland state that would be run by a unionist government. I mean, that was a really remarkable shift in British thinking that happened very quickly in the aftermath of the First World War, because obviously before the First World War, the idea was simply that, that Ulster would be excluded from, from the, the political settlement in the south of Ireland. And part of the reason why you have this new Northern Ireland state is, is because Britain feel the need to be seen to conform to that gospel of self-determination. You know, so we're entering a kind of a post-imperial age where it's expected that there must be some sort of democratic rationale to how new states are governed. Um, 
and the decision to offer Irish Republicans a self-governing uh, dominion rather than home rule also reflects that sort of ideological shift towards self-determination and um, democracy and a kind of a, the, the need not to do away with imperialism, but maybe to, to disguise or mask um, um, imperial structures. Um, in particular, pressure from the US and from the other British um, uh, empire dominions contributes to the decision, which can be seen in the other document which I've highlighted, which is the very first clauses of the Anglo-Irish Treaty to grant Ireland the same powers of self-government as enjoyed by Canada, Australia, New Zealand and South Africa. So it's the first few clauses of the treaty are strikingly kind of international. And it was the leader of the last of those dominions, uh, Jan Smuts um, from, from South Africa, who was particularly influential in pressuring the British government through King George V to essentially um, offer a generous you know, um, measure of, of, of uh, self-government to Ireland. And if we think about how this, you know, the rest of the world probably found this outcome quite surprising, the leverage of the Irish diaspora was pretty important in terms of, of, of how that situa situation came about. For example, when he's explaining to British MPs at Westminster, um, his government's, you know, frankly unpopular decision to extend dominion rule to the Irish Free State, Churchill notes how Britain's great interests in India and in Egypt, the dominions and the US had been damaged by the loud, insistent outcry raised by the Irish race all over the world. So, he, so Churchill is basically pitching that the main rationale for this Irish settlement, even though many British conservatives feel it's uh, offensive um, and maybe ideologically quite problematic, is essentially this, this is required to restore the international, Britain's international reputation and Britain's reputation with the US in particular. He's, you know, he's really not referring that much to Irish um, sentiment in justifying the settlement. And so the final point I just want to make concerns the role of British imperial interests in shaping uh, partition and the, the treaty, because I, I think there's a tendency in how these events are written about to emphasise the importance of differences within Ireland uh, more than the role of Britain in determining the overall um, parameters of the both settlements. So partition, for example, is seen as a, a regrettable but, but, but unavoidable outcome of irreconcilable divisions between Catholic nationalists and, and uh, Protestant unionists on the island of Ireland. The civil war similarly is seen as the outcome of irreconcilable differences between Republicans prepared to compromise on sovereignty and other Republicans unprepared to do so. But I think, I mean obviously there's something to these interpretations, but I think what, what they overlook is the extent to which Britain, which of course is the most powerful political actor um, on the stage, um, uh, in these conflicts over Irish sovereignty, shaped the parameters of both um, settlements and how these settlements also reflected much, much broader imperial concerns. So partition, for example, is designed to, to contain nationalist aspirations for independence within a reconfigured imperial framework. It's not like the partitions that you get in post-Second World War when it's a kind of a cut and run policy, rather it's a refiguring of imperial power that's going to last for decades to come. Um, and, you know, strangely from our perspective now, but the perceived success of partition in Ireland actually shaped British partition plans in Palestine and in India in decades to come. It was seen as a, a successful uh, way of sort of um, bringing about self-determination in a way which retained British imperial um, power. And similarly, Britain's insistence on the oath of fidelity to the monarch and Irish membership of the British Empire was, was based on concerns about imperial authority, not just in Ireland, but what the, the, uh, the parameters of, of um, a different settlement would be for places like Egypt and India and so on. Um, and so I think as we mark these difficult anniversaries a century on, focusing on global aspects of the Irish Revolution reminds us of the importance of political ideas. And these political ideas were international, global, transnational. They weren't necessarily rooted within um, Ireland, although they were certainly shaping what was happening in Ireland. Um, and particularly ideas about sovereignty, um, democracy uh, and empire, and how these were perhaps more central to the outworking of the revolution in Ireland than, than we might think maybe looking at, at, at the conflict primarily as a military series of events. Well, thank you very much. And uh, lots of food for thought there in uh, the opening remarks of Professor Fergal McGarry. And Fergal, can I ask you, that's very interesting the way in which you've situated the Irish Revolution within this new emerging world order. 
And uh, I wonder why has there been such an emphasis on the military side then for so long, rather than all of these other dimensions and the international perspective and diplomacy, mm. you know, you mentioned land, you mentioned all these other factors. Was it because of the, the people who were involved in the new state wanted that emphasis? Was it just that the popular image of a war of independence is more romantic or more, it captures the imagination better? Or what are the reasons for that? That yeah, emphasis. Uh, it's a great question, and um, I mean, I think actually there's, there's a number of different reasons, and, and Linda might want to talk about some of these later because I think they also relate to how the the War of Independence is reconceptualized as a military um, kind of event because that has very important implications for gender and mm -hmm. the idea of independence as being something achieved by soldiers rather than by revolutionaries of of, of um, women and. Uh, men. I think it's also to do with um, how uh, we have often written the history of the Irish Revolution. So we talk about the Irish Revolution, but we, 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 we do tend to reconstruct it in terms of things that happened that can be measured, things that we can count. Like the, 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 the principal way in which we sort of have studied the Irish Revolution, Revolution is through local studies. And there's nothing wrong with local studies. In, in fact, I think they're really good in terms of, you know, we're looking at the specific to get a sense of how rev the process of revolution works. But I think if you're just looking at the local, you're drawn into thinking about structures, who was in the IRA, how many ambushes took place, who was killed and so on. And I think that just draws you into a very kind of specific place. And what we're really trying to do in our project by using you know, global and transnational and, and comparative methodologies is just to try and open up um, thinking about how political changes political change works. So I think if you look at the local, you get a really good picture of how political change is operating. But you don't necessarily get, the, the, get that great insight into what the cause of political change is. So if you think about any fundamental political change, like suffrage for women, equal marriage, whatever it is, mo most of those changes are transnational. They happen very quickly, rapidly in many different places. And whereas if you're just looking at one place to sort of chart that, I think you can get drawn into sort of describing what's happening rather than thinking about the, the broader forces which are, are, are creating historical change. And Linda, that's very much the case when you look at gender and you look at, uh, and you look at violence, because in your work, it's also uh, what's happening. You know, when you look at the comparisons of what's happening in, in other parts of the world at this time, or also in other periods of history, uh, for example, France and Algeria, or uh, even when you look at uh, later violence against women during the Troubles, that, mm -hmm. that this is something that goes across time and space. Absolutely, and I, I suppose I would say it's the local and the global at the same time. You know, um, sometimes it's some of the issues I'm looking at, they are actually very specific and local because of the sources. So some of this is source-led. So for instance, if you have very good military archives, it will lead to more of the kinds of studies that, that you're describing, uh, Fergal, there. Whereas if we look at uh, the, the frameworks in which we understand revolution, that's where you see, I think, the real creativity around the relationship, you know, between uh, the local and the global. So in, in terms of I, I, when you talk about as well the expansion of democracy, if you think of, you know, the, the democratic revolution that was part of the Irish Revolution, perhaps the biggest development was the expansion of the vote to women. So it, that immediately changed. Well, it didn't change, you know, society, but it was a significant step in terms of extending the idea of democracy, the idea that some women initially uh, could actually vote, uh, never mind uh, uh, be uh, members of, of parliament or, or later. Um, so you see, you see, I suppose, the way in which these, yes, universalist principles and demands, revolutionary demands, uh, equality for women, uh, interact with uh, the local and the national, I would say, uh, at the same time. And gender is a very good way of doing that because, you know, gender inequality, if you want to call it that, uh, is, is, can be very specific to a, a culture or society. I, in Ireland, religion plays a big part when we look at questions around gender. Um, when we look at, um, you know, one of the issues I talked about earlier, the, the, the erasure of what happened to women in the revolution 
why was that? You could argue it's because of the particular taboo around um, sexuality, around power, around attitudes to women. And some of that is particular to Ireland and the way in which Irish society was developing and built upon its revolution. But in other contexts, it wasn't. So, for instance, we can look at... Um, the work of, let's say, Valentin Mokadon, who's an Iranian sociologist who has analysed global revolutions from the perspective of gender. And she, she, looks, she doesn't actually look at Ireland, which is interesting, but she does. She looks at the revolutions in Mexico, um, you know, a whole Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe. She lists a whole range, um, Russia, and she, she has a model which is, um, has two parts. So one is what she calls in the aftermath of revolution, the women in the family model. And this is, Ireland follows this. Uh, women very quickly become part of the domestic structure of society. Um, but in other revolutions, women actually gained rights. So you can see how the interplay, their connection between the culture, the society, and the kind of revolution that progressed and gender, you know, in that comparative approach that you're describing can tell us a lot. But I do think, particularly with some of the issues I'm looking at there, the sources are so, the evidence is so so sparse. It's just, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that actually, I use the term surviving evidences, because there is actually, you know, it's very difficult. Um, you know, there isn't a, a sexual violence archive. There's never going to be one mm -hmm. because it's underreported. So so in, in some in some ways, you know, the local is very important. The micro, maybe, is a better yeah. word. But in other contexts, then, it's very important to also look at that broader picture of the relationship between gender and warfare. So it's both, I would yeah, say. Yeah, I mean, I would think, Linda, probably both our pro projects are looking at, at, at spaces and networks. Yeah. And so, I mean, sometimes it's my kind of concern in doing a global history of, our, of Irish revolution is the sense that you're discounting the importance of the local or national. But it's, it's not that. It, it, it's, it's the way of being able to look at different um, types of space for different kinds yeah. of questions and looking at the interplay between so big global changes such as you know, su suffrage or, I mean, th so we started off with our project with, with two very basic questions, mm. which is um, uh, how do events in Ireland resonate abroad? And how does the fact that the world is being transformed mm beyond Irish borders in 1919, the collapse of empire, the emergence of new states. How does that impact back in Ireland? And, and very quickly, if you look at a specific kind of event, you're brought into really interesting kind of um, um, areas that require you both to have a sense of global change, but also of specifics. So uh, Brian, who is going to be here, I think was going to be talking mm -hmm. about um, what the consequences of the Terence McSweeney hunger strike. Yeah. So Terence McSweeney's, this, this violence is occurring um, in Cork one of the consequences of that is that it, it, it exports violence and a, a different kind of sectarian violence to, to Ulster um, as a consequence of that. McSweeney uh, dies on hunger strike and that um, leads to a global kind of response. Maybe 15, 20 countries have strikes and protests and so on. It shuts, it leads to the shutting down of the New York um, waterfront when you have um, a protest by, led by, by women, actually, by Irish-American women, the women pickets for the enforcement of the American war aims. And so you're very quickly brought into, when you look at the process of revolution, that it's sort of operating in different ways in different places. So what's happening in New York, women are more prominent, but also class is more obvious. Um, mm. Trade unions and, uh, and, and, and labor movements, in which there's a very big Irish kind of contingent, um, are to the fore. And you also bring in questions which are less relevant in Ireland, such as race. So you've got, for example, quite a lot of support from black rights activists, people like W.E.B. Du Bois and Marcus Garvey mm -hmm. for the Irish question. Um, and so when you start thinking not just about the Irish abroad, but actually the significance of the Irish question, it, it opens up much broader questions about about revolutionary and, and, and political change. And Fergal, in a way, David Fitzpatrick, the late great David Fitzpatrick's groundbreaking work on, on County Clare, I think it was 1978, yeah. and it led to so many uh, local counties. But in a way, this is, this is almost like taking that model but applying it to what's happening outside of Ireland. It's the next great historiographical leap. Yeah, I think we had like so we had this template of how do you understand Irish revolution? It was by reconstructing it in incredible detail, as David did so well, and other people like like Peter Hart and so on. And then you had this other literature about the Irish Revolution, which focused on the on the diaspora, primarily histories of nationalism in 
the US and Canada. And, and, but I think where the gap was, which, which our project in particular really tried to, um, which is a collaborative project with a lot of different people working on, on the different publications, was to, to try and think about the connections between diasporic nationalism and what's happening in Ireland. And again, looking at an instant like the response to the, the Terence McSweeney Hunger Strike shows you how it can bring um, t together a lot of that. So, for example, a lot of the um, diasporic activism, it's not sort of radiating out from Ireland with sort of Irish Republicans sort of t suggesting what should happen, but it's, it's coming from many different places and uh, you know you've got figures like for example um, Daniel Mannix who plays a big role actually in the response to um, to, to, to Max Sweeney um, and he becomes a you know a leading kind of um, a figure in terms of shaping global opinion uh, in Australia and America traveling to to Britain so I think that those bringing out those kind of um, wider networks um, come from sort of thinking about raising horizons spatially from 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 the the town or the county or even the nation and just just following through um you know particular mo revolutionary moments linda fergal had mentioned the importance of propaganda and and that hugely significant dimension especially for the international community and i wonder was there ever any thought of Using, I can understand why perhaps violence against women, mm. they, they didn't want to make mention it or make m much of a deal about it after independence and uh, and a silence descended. But I wonder, was there ever any thought given to to making this a, a, an object of propaganda and weaponizing it against the British during the War of Independence? Um, it's an interesting question. I think others have slightly touched on that or looked at it. Again, I'd mentioned Louise Ryan, perhaps Marie Coleman might have looked at that to some extent. Um, not extensively, I would say. And again, you know, I could give a few theories maybe as to why that was the case. I mean, I, I actually gave a seminar in, in Trinity in September and Yunan Halpin asked me a very good question. He said, given that hair cutting, for instance, which you know, is, 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 is a pretty awful practice to, 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 to not to put a finer point in it. It's not just a, someone cutting your hair, you know, it involves no consent, um, often force. Usually the pattern was large groups, maybe 15, 20 sometimes, or generally masked. And it was very strategic. It was very planned. Um, so it wasn't kind of random. And we see it in most counties. You know, we see examples of this across a range of sources, which is interesting. Newspapers, witness statements, um, you know, there's, you know, personal papers. So um, family memory. So, so I, I think what's interesting is that this was obviously something which was... Um, part of the regime, shall we say. Tim mm -hmm. Wilson uses the term regimes. He's looking at um, global conflict as well. So this was one of the regimes of the conflict. It was to target women in this way who were considered uh, dangerous in terms of passing on information or simply because they were exercising choice in terms of who they wanted to mm -hmm. A, speak to, or B, step out with or have a relationship, which seems a pretty basic right um, to most of us. But this was considered... Um, taboo and also dangerous for the you know Republican um, cause because you could pass on information that could you know put mm. uh, combatants in a very dangerous situation. So 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 Yunan asked me why in you know the witness statements and you know wh why did nobody say I I cut hair? <laughs> you know it, you see very few examples um, of you know activists in that period actually saying they engaged in this. And I think um, it's part of what you're asking me in the question, that this was, it was taboo, and it isn't part of the heroic mm. narrative. I, I think yeah. also perceptions are important because when, when the, one of the, the iconic moments of hair cutting that people would be familiar with be from the wind that shakes the barley and of course it's, yeah. it's the British who are shown this doing the That's hair right. bobbing yeah. Linda am I right in thinking that the majority of hair bobbing would probably have been done by Republicans? Um, there isn't an estimate on that I mean I would say it's probably more equal mm -hmm. um, again it depends sometimes ide ideology comes into play it might be nice to blame say the British did this mm -hmm. more than the Irish side um, it, you know again you know, it's it's probably more documented in terms of the Republican side because of the kinds of sources we have. 
so I think it would be, it's very important, you know, in talking about the global revolution, that mm. British sources are mined and looked at. I think there's an awful lot of work to be done there in terms of, um, you know, the kinds of papers you have in Q, uh, et cetera. So most of the analysis has, has looked at Irish military archives or newspapers are a really good source because they seem to you know record these on a very mm -hmm. regular basis and give a lot of detail as well so um so i think so i think that that, that i suppose the way in which it's reported i wouldn't describe mm -hmm. it as propaganda it's simply you know mm -hmm. x happened on friday mm -hmm. night in clonmel um and you know uh, on the crown forces side then you have it through other kinds of a report. Sometimes there's a reprisal dimension as well, because if the Crown forces are engaging in this, you know, um, then the IRA will will react. But you reverse that. You know, it it, it seems that, you know, but uh, it, the relationship some women had with Crown forces was treated with equal contempt uh, to the cutting of hair by yeah. Crown forces. So you have this kind of double-edged thing going on around the way in which women become targets yeah. um, in the conflict. But I would say it was more a case of cover-up yeah. and, you know, uh, sort of taboo. And again, you see the same thing in other conflicts, in yeah. other periods at the end of the Second World War, yeah. uh, French women who were believed yeah. to have consorted. Yeah. And, and that's some of the terms that are used here as well. Absolutely. People who are seen as having consorted with British soldiers yeah. or ha had relation, co yeah. uh, had conversations. And uh, but you see some of the same weapons to humiliate and to, yeah. to mark these people out. Yeah. I, th I think that also brings in the, the, the comparative question too. And I think one of the areas, there's, you know, there's been a lot of research done on gendered violence and sexual violence. One of the areas where it seems to me there still is really disagreement or a lack of consensus anyways on the scale of it, you know. Um, it, 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 there's, there's, you know, there's a, there's a school of thought that while uh, these things happened, and of course they, they were going to happen in any kind of conflict, an important question is to, to ask, you know, to, to what, ex how, how common was it compared to conflicts elsewhere? So there's interesting questions about scales of violence, which apply not just to gender and sexual violence, but also to, to I think, all different forms of violence, because there's a, there's a big literature which looks at the kind of violence that erupts across much of Central and Eastern Europe from mm -hmm. 1918 onwards. You go from conflicts between state armies mm -hmm. to conflicts with paramilitaries, uh, ethno-sectarian types of conflict, and that leads in a lot of countries to, um, to, to much more extreme forms of violence. So you mentioned, uh, Linda, Tim Wilson's work, you know, one yeah. of Tim's, uh, mm -hmm. he, I don't think he looked at gendered violence in any detail, but one of his conclusions looking at the kind of violence you have in, um, in Ulster, um, and violence you have in somewhere like Silesia is just how much more explosive this, the scale of it is. So I think there's, a, I mean, I, I think you need to be careful when you're comparing violence to not to yeah. suggest you're min, 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 minimizing mm -hmm. it. I mean, mm -hmm. one of the things I'm struck by is how the, the relatively small scale of violence, awful that it was that accompanied, say, um, the revolution or partition in Ireland compared to, say, what's happening in the Ottoman Empire or what's happening, say, in, in, in India a couple of decades later. But despite that, the impact of that violence the, the longevity of that, the how it kind of creates these kind of political structures that are, are with us today in some respects. So I think there's, a, there's an interesting question about how much violence there was, which is not the kind of s the same thing as saying, well, maybe this violence wasn't important. I think it's hugely important, but it's interesting to ask that question about why was there not more violence? Why do we have, mm -hmm. why do we not have more certain types of violence? Mm -hmm. How does that compare across other conflicts? And that brings us into, you know, a whole range of interesting questions about why certain kind of, um, senses of order and behavior and respectability and so on might have constrained how mm. people acted. Because obviously there's another certain area of the Irish Revolution in which we're looking at, you know, a, a much worse civil war, much more uh, ethnic or sectarian violence. Mm. And that didn't happen. I think one big answer to that is the sort of the, the geopolitical control you have in Eastern and Central Europe, empires collapsing in a kind of a free for all. But because of the continuation of British power, it's a much more controlled process what happens in Ireland. Just, you know, you can think of all these certain moments like leading up to the Irish Civil War where things really could have got out of control, but you, you know, you've got this British Army security forces that basically are constraining, I think, um, you know, uh, 
how badly things can fall apart, I suppose. And for the subheading or the, the, the subtitle for tonight's discussion is uh, what the archives tell us. And uh, we have a wonderful National Archives uh, organising today's event, wonderful documents and collections there. And perhaps in the past we might have thought if you want to understand the Irish Revolution, it's our own Irish collections, it's perhaps collections in Britain. But maybe from what you're suggesting, we also need to be international in our focus and see what do the archives around the world also have to tell us. Yeah, I mean, one of the really interesting things that's coming out of the, I mean, I think it was Peter Hart who said Ireland probably has the best documented revolution everywhere, uh, uh, anywhere, or certainly among them. But that was before the, the Bureau of Military yeah. History and the Military Service Pension Collection. And there are extraordinary kind of archival collections, as well as obviously the wealth of collection we have in the, in the National Archives, which is more focused on what's happening um, in terms of the, the, the political structures. But if you think about something like the military service pensions, what's extraordinary is it gives you insight into the experiences of, well, the 15,000 or so people who, who got pensions, but 70 or 80,000 people who applied. You have a kind of a history of the lives they led after the revolution. And one interesting dimension of that is the extent to which people lived global lives in terms of emigration, um, moving around and so on. Um, it was a recent um, release by the military service um, collection which looks at where brigades went to in the 20s and 30s and you've got places whether it's in parts of um, uh, Catholic parts of Antrim or whether it's down in Kerry for, for a combination of political and economic reasons where you know most, most people have effectively left. Um, so I think that archive in particular is transforming the extent to which we can really get a, a you know a rich insight into people's lived lives and it's for the most part it's you know it's a there are some pretty depressing aspects of it, particularly the extent to which people's lives were shaped by um, poverty, uh, unemployment and so on. And also, to a certain extent, disappointment and disillusionment in terms of maybe revolutionary aspirations not being Mental being health, yeah. nervous breakdowns, Trauma, these all yeah. feature, you know, really prominently in these um, papers. I mean, it's a qualitative I describe it as qualitative sources, you know, where they really give you, you capture experience, you know, rather than crude data. Um, and I think, you know, they can be analysed in many different ways, which is very interesting. I think, though, that, that you know, getting back to the, the, the frameworks, I suppose I'm less concerned with talking about violence that didn't happen and more concerned with understanding the violence that did, you know, or, or the events that happened. Uh, you know, I think it, it's very clear that, the Irish Revolution, whether you're talking about the latter part in particular, which is mostly what we're focusing on tonight, you know, that, that Ireland, I, Ireland is a small island and, you know, it's asymmetrical warfare. So I think, you know, something like gender, for instance, it actually is a good window to understand the scale of the conflict because, you know, the, 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 the way in which women were targeted is actually intrinsically connected with the way in which warfare was structured and the political events as well so so you know so it's it's i suppose i i'm not too worried about you know what was happening in the other part of the world per se in terms of scale i think i suppose at this point i think one of the really you know and it's it's demonstrated in your work fergal and and um and enda delaney's and and dara gannon's and, and brian hanley's um you know how i think it's been very enriching and in, in, gender, in relation to gender as well, how as the decade of centenaries has progressed, I think the analysis has expanded, but also deepened. And I think that's really exciting in terms of, you know, what we're discussing here tonight, that we actually are asking questions. So, well, well, you know, what was the scale of, you know, violence against women in that period? Nobody was asking that really kind of 10 or 20 years ago. There was bits of discussion about it, but now that's a central part of the discussion. You know, likewise, what you're, you know, raising as well there about, you know, if you think about it, the, the hair cutting is another good example of this. So, like, this was, you know, what happened in the liberation of France, the, the Nazi um, collaborators, you know, the women who were paraded through the streets who had their hair... Um, head shaved in public actually which was a different expression than what happened in Ireland it was mostly kind of hidden away mm. fields and all that it wasn't this kind of carnival spectacle or look at the Spanish Civil War um you know the Republican women um you know who had their their heads shaved but also other kinds of violence that were perpetrated there but this, this was after the revolution in mm -hmm. Ireland and I find it so interesting that this was happening in Ireland before 
these other conflicts, you name it, the Greek Civil War, um, Algeria, Ukraine. This is a feature of, of 20th century um, conflict. And it was happening in Ireland on a much, much, much smaller scale. But still in all, I, I, I do find that sort of fascinating as a practice that it was occurring. And then obviously it was occurring in the Rhineland um, you know, in, 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 the, uh, in, in the First World War as well. But it was happening in Ireland. And there's, so there's something a bit deeper to be looked at there in terms yeah. of going back, I think, as well. Yeah, no, I, and the other thing I'd kind of add is, like, if we were having this conversation 20 years ago, we would probably be talking a lot about women's history. And yeah. we're, now, we're now talking about gender, so I think it's important also to think about um, how men and masculinity fits yeah. into this. One of the things that really struck me looking at Yuna No Halpin and, and uh, uh, Dahi O'Karoin's book was the statistic that 96% of the, the, the dead of the revolution were male. And yeah. these were mostly people in their, you know, teenagers yeah. or in their early 20s and that's quite extraordinary so the extent to which kind of um you know a certain kind of masculinity is 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 is, and 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 is militarized in a revolutionary situation that is striking and i think one of the really interesting reasons to look at gender whether it's looking at women's experiences or men is to think about how you have that process in which a kind of a political um there's a sort of a political order restored in the 20s and gender is so crucial um, yeah. to how that's done. W w women are no longer revolutionaries. They're, they're maybe arguably even not really mm. not really equal citizens. Mm. Um, you know, their, 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 uh, their roles in terms of what they did is kind of erased from the early accounts of the revolutionary period that begin to be published. And we get this very kind of, um, this sense that really women are just sort of a, a, a become building blocks for kind of the idea of a kind of a, a virtuous Catholic kind of um, mm -hmm. um, moral nation. I think that's re a really, um, important but surprising consequence of how the Irish Revolution kind of mm. kind of worked out that it didn't go in in that kind of emancipatory direction that mm -hmm. a lot of the revolutionary generation certainly from you know the Easter Rising kind of period would have expected yeah. but it became a much more conservative project in which gender was used to kind of um, uh, repress and restore order and, mm -hmm. and and close down options and and horizons and I think we're only unpacking some of the, the yeah. political and constitutional legacy of that in the last couple of decades. Very good. We're going to open it up now to <laughs> questions. But before that, Linda, just following on from what Fergal mm. said, it probably has made a difference as well then in recent decades that we've approached these issues using different lenses like feminism, sociology, all these yeah. different approaches that yeah. uh, that's probably enriched the, uh, the analysis as well. Absolutely. I think the, the women's movement in the 1970s, really, if you think about it, you know, some of the topics I'm speaking about, it really did come out of the first rape crisis centres, um, you know, women's aid opened up, I suppose, a space for analysis, a different kind of discussion uh, around uh, these kinds of issues. I, I think as well, if you think about it, um, you know, I, th I think sexuality is key as well, and I agree with you with masculinity, and Jennifer Redmond has a very good new special issue in the Irish Studies Review on masculinity and the revolution. We're very good in Manutha at doing um, gender um, and revolution, and Una Frawley as well has done a lot of work on commemoration, um, gender and commemoration. Some of us are in that volume as well. But if you think about sexuality um, and you think about violence, if you, if you look at all of the recent debate, for instance, about the mother and baby homes, Many of those institutions, that idea of what I'm talking about, the social control of women's intimate choices, of their sexuality, all of that, you know, transfers into, you know, the, the, the women who, you know, were pregnant outside marriage or, you know, they were institutionalised. So you can see those, um, I'm not going to make a wild now connection between the two, but you know what I'm saying? There are threads of continuity there between gender social control, um, some would go so far as to say misogyny, misogynistic attitudes to women. This is a, a, a very interesting question because you do see, uh, we mentioned the Ken Mayer case earlier, if you look at the reaction, the way in which the women who were horrifically treated in that attack by, by members of the Free State Army, um, the misogyny towards those women, the remarks that were made. Um, I, I use Ernest Blythe's witness statement mm -hmm. all the time, uh, where he, he said it was just a, 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 a troop of tarts getting a few lashes. It was presented as in they had, they had jilted um, a certain officer and that you're, you know, what were they thinking? Like, were they asking for it kind of thing? And we see those kinds of attitudes to women of culpability, 
uh, for the punishment they got, that they somehow did something um, that, that suggested they deserved that. I mean, um, you know, one, one organisation that we've not really touched upon, where, where again would be absolutely central in what we're talking about or not talking about a few decades ago, is of course the Catholic Church in terms of how it shapes how 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 yeah. um, uh, you know pe people are are thinking. I guess, uh, a really important kind of dimension of understanding what happens in the 1920s and 1930s. We have a revolution which originates as a republican revolution, but yeah. essentially becomes uh, a, a revolution which which creates a very a, a deeply Catholic, nationalist, socially conservative order, and this central role that the church plays in that, not as an as a top-down oppressor imposing some kind of tyranny, but in terms of meeting the values that a lot of people mm -hmm. in in society had at that time. And I think that's something that we're still, you know, think need to trace through in a sort of a complex way. And it brings us back to sort of structures and, and, and wider forces. The fact, for example, that we had a partitionist um, settlement mm -hmm. that created the Catholic state and the Protestant state, that, you know, that really yeah. empowered the Catholic Church in a way that a, a different political arrangement um, you know, wouldn't have. Very good. Well, we might open it first to our uh, small number of, of guests uh, in, in, our, in our gathering here, yes? Uh, and, and microphones. Thank you. Um, really interesting, um, both uh, both presentations. I just like, what, what, while you were talking, I thought of a crossover. You were talking about the hunger strike as a weapon mm. of uh, struggle. And I couldn't, obviously, I, 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 I immediately thought of the suffragists in, the suffragettes yeah. in, in, in Britain, certainly, who um, employed the hunger strike mm -hmm. as, a, as a weapon. And what it started to make me think was that um, there, there are these crossovers, and there are, it's, in a way, people are learning at that time how to conduct revolutions, mm -hmm. in a way. They're kind of learning not just tactics, but actually how you behave, what you do in a revolutionary situation. And also the idea of struggle and resistance, which I think is very strong, and particularly among... Um, Women. Mm. So, in a sense, the you know you, the, the First World War is a very strong um, idea of the, of the rape of Belgium and, yeah. the, and the idea of the woman violated and the yeah. the the sort of shiv chivalry of the mm. soldier who goes in to defend the honour of 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 the downtrodden woman. Mm. But at the same time, there are also women who are being subjected to force feeding, uh, or just mm. pr just prior to the. Second, the, sorry, the First World War in Britain, who are also, in a sense, using mm. their their lack of power mm. as a weapon against the uh, really, in a sense, saying, "Look at the outrageous things that are being to, done to our bodies." Yeah. But they're not running away from it; they're using it as a weapon, mm. as a political weapon. So I'm kind of interested in in thinking as well about the way that women are not just simply. Um, the, um, the victims, if you like, of, yeah. of, of, of war, but are starting to move into um, being activists and being engaged and being part of this new kind of warfare in a way, which is civilian, maybe get people get involved, maybe it's about guerrilla warfare and resistance, yeah. both at the community, but also at the individual level. And I'd love to hear what you have to think about, what you'd like to say about that. Yeah, uh, um, uh, Will Murphy has written a great study of um, political mm -hmm. imprisonment, which he, he, he notes how the Republicans were probably, you know, taking the hunger strike tactic from women, but they were very reluctant to sort of admit that because they didn't want to be seen as using a feminine, a feminine tactic. Mm -hmm. So instead you get all this stuff about, oh, it's an old Gaelic kind mm -hmm. of uh, um, custom. But um, I'm, I'm, I, th I think the hunger strike is quite powerful also in invoking the idea of moral force yeah. And that goes back to what I was talking about earlier. That was, a, a, you know, a, a card that the Republicans had that was really effective to, to play. So when I was looking at these slightly un, un, unusual kind of radical circles, so people like Marcus Garvey and W.E. Du Bois, it's the, it's the hunger strike um, of McSweeney in particular which strikes him as saying, what is it about the Irish question that, you know, that, that, that there is some broader struggle for, for, for freedom or social justice or self-determination, and that's incredibly powerful. But it's not, you know, it's not a kind of a violence inflicted, it's that notion of a violence endured which is so powerful. I'm also struck, um, in terms of your, your, your question, suffrage networks were so useful for Republicans yeah. internationally and globally. Mm. 
Um, the Irish Republicans in, in Paris don't get to meet Wilson. It's, it's um, Hannah Shee Skeffington who does mm -hmm. in America, Mary McSweeney's trips uh, and propaganda tours. But a lot of these people then just get written out of the, um, mm -hmm. you know, they're, 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 they're depicted as historical yeah. um, during the Civil War. And then they're just kind mm -hmm. of written out of, uh, out of the history uh, subsequently. But those kind of radical networks, um, mm -hmm. the, the suffrage movement was so internationalist and that was really valuable to, to mm -hmm. the Republican movement. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree completely with that. I, mean, I, I think, um, again, the hunger strike is a very good example of, of the body, you know, of how the body is, you know, an, another way of thinking about, you know, conflict revolution, apart from that kind of, you know, narrow military uh, interpretation. So, so the symbolic importance um, of that, I think, is very important. And again, that feeds into the whole, you know, the, the, um, you know, the way in which that's reported in the international press and so forth. So symbols, but the body as a symbol, I think, is, 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 is very important there. Um, absolutely. I mean, the, the, you know, the way in which, for instance, um, in the post-revolutionary period, you know, the women who were anti-treaty, for instance, were portrayed, you know, and I think, again, revisionism with a small or, you know, really, you know, there needs to be very clear, critical analysis of some of those women. They were presented, you know, as, as, as um, hysterical, as mad. And of course, that's the oldest gendered trope in, in the book, isn't it? Um, they were actually very effective political leaders. Um, you know, I was reading a, a newspaper report in Ballina that Mar Ma Mary McSweeney spoke at, and there were like 3,000 turned up to hear her speak. I mean, she must have been an incredible orator. I couldn't hold 3,000 in, in Ballina. Um, so things like that. So, so actually, maybe you know, peeling back the kind of gendered stereotypes that were allowed to develop. Um, again, Hannah Shee Skeffington, an amazing uh, international ambassador. Um, Muriel McSweeney, we were talking about this at the beginning. Again, I think someone who's completely uh, has been kind of misunderstood um, as well. She was, um, you know, a communist, you know, after, you know, she left Ireland. Um, you know, she lived in Germany. She lived in Paris. Um, she was very involved in, 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 in the Communist Party. She was a very effective political organiser. You know, I think she was 90 when she died. You know, so there's a whole story there around her involvement after the Irish Revolution in, 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 in left-wing revolutionary, anti-Catholic, she was very anti-Catholic, um, movements in a European context with, with some of the leading um, left-wing intellectuals. Um, it's a fascinating story. And it's again, it's like the two parts to her life. The Irish bit is only one part. The second bit mm -hmm. is, is what she did afterwards. Um, so, um, and again, she was, you know, has been presented in a, in a less than, I suppose, um, positive light, shall we say. I read something recently in a newspaper that suggested, you know, she was basically kind of destroyed with mental illness. Now, I know some have written about that, but she also managed to be a, a very powerful uh, political activist. So I think we need to think through, revise some of the frameworks uh, and assumptions about that. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right as well, of course, that the, the you know, the, 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 you know, the, the whole question of Belgium and, you know, if you look at Anthony Beaver's work in Berlin and all of this, if you look at Spain, um, the way in which, um, you know, women were, were um, I suppose, punished in the Spanish Civil War as well, takes on its own um, particular uh, course. In some of these, um, we're talking Civil War now in relation to Spain, but many women were disappeared as well. That's a difference with the Irish Revolution. Um, uh, we have some, a small number of women who, who disappeared, so to speak, but it's very, very small. Whereas in other conflicts, that's it's a massive issue. So, um, yeah, so, so, so I agree with you completely. I think it's about, I suppose, again, clearly we, I think ethically we can't deny what happened in that period. But it's also, you're right, ethically, we also are not trying to create a narrative of victimhood. You know, it's about um, balancing, I suppose, that question of agency with the trauma and sometimes life altering trauma um, that arose as a consequence of the Irish Revolution. Yeah. I think also we have to look at gendered roles within a kind of a historical context. I think one of the maybe slightly problematic aspects of the 1916 centenary was you had a kind of a celebration of the gun woman, you know, the Countess Markovich type. 
role, which is, is of course so unrepresentative of the role played by most women. And it's not necessarily to, 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 to negate what they did, to appreciate that their roles were confined through gender because some of those roles were actually important. You know, think about logistics and um, even in the military side of things. But also you think about things like um, in terms of uh, propaganda and so on, or you think about, I mean, we're here thinking about the treaty, you think about the women uh, on their knees praying and so on. There was propaganda methods that were open to women because of the gendered you know, ideas about their roles. And there's a kind of agency there of sorts. You know, we, we can't just obviously, um, you know, it would be unfortunate if we just celebrate certain types of activity which conform to a more egalitarian sense of, um, mm -hmm. you know, a revolutionary or a combatant now, because that's, that's not how most women at the time would have seen the appropriateness of their roles, you know, within, within the national movement. You know, they weren't all feminists. Very good. Uh, Michael Kennedy? Thank you very much. That's an, such a, a rich discussion tonight. And I, I was thinking of a term Fergal used there about unpacking. Uh, and I was wondering about the way we're approaching now the history of what we're, what you're both discussing there. No, you're right. We couldn't have done this 30 years ago. So what is it that changes? Is it a function of the society that we're living in? And we see the past through our own you know, norms and tropes and mores or, or whatever. Because an archive can be released and nobody will look at it. Yeah. Like what you were talking about, about the newspapers there, the local yeah, newspapers are such yeah. a, yeah. yeah. And so is there a process, and I'm thinking that even the international comparisons you've made would not have been made 30 years ago. And I'm picking that term because I'm thinking of my own historical, <laughs> my own longevity or whatever as a, as a historian. We couldn't have had a discussion like this with those who were there before us because they weren't mentally thinking in that way. That space wasn't being occupied as much as, as it is now. So is there a process by which countries, peoples, nations begin to unpack their revolutionary experience? You, do, you look at the military first. It's heroic. Uh, then you move on to maybe look at the winners and the losers. It becomes more complicated. You can see where I'm, where I'm going with this. Is Ireland in any way unique in this? Or is this a process you talked about, Silesia, post-war France, Algeria? Uh, we can look at Rwanda, uh, Congo, South Africa, um, the wars in, in Latin, Latin America in the 1930s. You know, it goes on. Uh, is there something here that you could maybe comment on about how, as a society, and also how historians, journalists, and others have unpacked the... Uh, revolutionary period over the last hundred years. And the final point I'd put on that is, could we have got where we are tonight earlier? And how does complex a discussion 30 years ago? And if not, why not? Is it simply the archives weren't available? Or was it we as a people? Or is there some other factor in there that you might take from international comparisons that you could point at and look at. Oh, very shrewd questioning, as usual, from Michael. Uh, question. <laughs> Where do we start? I, I know it's, you're, you're totally um, on the ball. Um, I mean, I can only speak from my experience as well, so there's a few, there's a few different things. First of all, I think um, it's this generation who want to know. So in my experience, for instance, of maybe relatives of some of the women who have reached out to me and said, such and such happened. My father never spoke about it, or my aunt, or whatever. But someone said something to me at a funeral years ago and said, that happened to your aunt, your grandmother. Or somebody said something in, kind of quietly. So I think the middle generation, this is a vast generalization, but it's my, my opinion, I suppose, that they really, they, they didn't feel they could go there in a way this generation, I use that broadly, feel at this point in time that they can. And I think this generation want to know. If you look at the whole idea of testimony, you know, and, and, and family memory and all of those really interesting areas, you know, if you look at Fergal Keane's work, for instance, I think that's a very good example. Um, he spoke at the West Cork History Festival, you know, again, about scale and all these issues we we're discussing. And he, and he was describing it, the impact, I suppose, the, the psychological impact of the revolution over time and and how that might shape, you know, family dynamics and all these things. But it's a bit like putting a, a big rock in a small pond, you know, in the context of the revolution. So I would say memory is long. 
but that it's this generation, in my experience, Michael, of you know, some of the work I'm doing, which is on some very difficult um, topics, that they want to know. They want to know what happened and they want to see the records. So the, the, be the good thing about the, the pensions applications, and, and you can just log on and you can read about your neighbour up the road and find out what they were doing and uh, how much, you know, well, maybe you can't see how much they got, but, you know, all this kind of thing, what they were doing. Um, I, I have friends my age who, who, who found out their grandparents were involved in the IRA and they never knew, um, you know, all this kind of thing. So, so I think there was, um, I suppose, a desire to forget um, as Guy Biner would say, that that was a, a cultural, a, a kind of almost a, a, a cultural construct. Um, some of that was for good reason, because terrible things happened in very micro um, context. Some of it was um, the way in which, I suppose, the history was written. It was a top-down, you know, the grassroots. We're talking really about experience, um, networks was a term used. It's a very grassroots, bottom-up history from below, as it was called. So I think, so it's, it, yes. So it's partly that it's partly that I think this generation want to know, and they can ask questions maybe the previous generation couldn't. Secondly, it is about the way um, history has perhaps taken a bit more of a postmodern turn. We're talking about intersections, you know. We're t not talking about truths. We're not, you know, it's not a Rankian um, a approach. Perhaps it's a change in the discipline, I would like to think, that there are a little few more female professors um, and, you know, that it's perhaps a less masculinist discipline in terms of who has epistemic authority. All of those kinds of questions. There are more feminists like me asking difficult questions maybe about power, about, you know. So all of these things, I think, are combining. And, of course, the sources. I mean, the sources now are just... As I said, you, anyone in a, a local community can, can, you know, look up something. So, so there's a kind of a democratisation. Um, there's a democratisation in terms of access to knowledge of that period. There's a deeper analysis, as I said, as I said earlier, more informed perhaps by, by theory, um, you know, more informed by, you know, questions about memory, commemoration, all of these things. So, so, um, but I, I do feel in my own work, I think people want to know for whatever reasons. It, just a final quick point. I think, you know, other, in other contexts, you know, you had truth and reconciliation processes that didn't happen here. It just, you know, it didn't happen. So perhaps that reflection or post-mortem or whatever it is that occurs, it, it, it just, it didn't happen. Um, and um, so, so, so I think perhaps, um, you know, that's what's occurring now. I suppose the, the, the historians, I'll let Fergal come in here, but the historians might say it is something perhaps to do with the troubles in Northern Ireland and from the 1970s onwards. It became difficult to talk about the granny who was in Common or the, 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 the grandfather in the IRA, and, or indeed, in my own case, I had a grandfather in the Somme. He never spoke about it. Um, it. It was the Church of Ireland that reached out to my family eventually and invited them to um, a, a commemoration service. It meant so much to my father and my uncle. You know, these kinds of local acts, healing gestures, I think are happening now, and people want to know. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd agree with, with, with much of that. I mean, I think history is how we, in the present, look at the past and the, the, the questions that we ask and the, the things that we're interested in reflect where we are at now. I think the political context is very important, as Linda suggests. Uh, I mean, I was doing my PhD in the 1990s when there were still just you know, vicious rows about aspects of the revolution that are now people across the spectrum of their politics take us for granted that terrible things yes. were, were, were done. It's just a, it's just a, a fact. Um, I mean, people talk about, well, the Civil War would be very difficult to, com to commemorate. I mean, I may be wrong in this, but I, I don't really think so because the Civil War is now history. It's not, it's not the, the past. But as someone who spends a lot of time working and living in the North, yeah. you know, partition isn't history. You know? so, so a lot of things that people can have relaxed conversations about down south are, are still people are still in their silos and there's a political implication to how you analyze um, something so I think a lot of it is just the, the passage of time and people invest less of their emotion and identity and become more interested in just asking questions about the past and we have all that evidence I'm quite struck by the difference maybe between 
what historians know and what the public know. So I think about the work of someone like Margaret Ward, who was writing all this you know, fantastic work about the role played by women, and she was publishing that in the 1980s. It's not really until, I would say, until the 20, 2016 that you have, in terms of a major commemoration, that you have women everywhere. So, so, so in other words, lot, not just Margaret, but Margaret was certainly to the fore. Lots of people have been writing about what women did, but there isn't a, a real public appetite for reading about that and celebrating about that and making that part of culture and commemoration and so on until later. And, I mean, I would be drawn to kind of, again, the political context to think about that. I mean, I think the big difference between, uh, apart from the troubles, which is an important context, but I think another big difference in the last couple of decades is we, we become a sort of a post-Catholic country in a lot of ways and po po post-nationalist. We become a much more liberal country. I think that's good and bad. You know, we might think it, it's, it, it's much more pluralist. It's also more consumerist. But I think that means then that you, you tell different stories about the past. And again, I think, the decade of centenaries and 2016 is a good example of the way in which, you know, you could talk about people who simply hadn't been remembered for 100 years, and they're, suddenly they're, they're very important stories, like, for example, the civilians and the children uh, who, who died. Mm -hmm. Why is there no interest in speaking about those people publicly for 90 years? It's, you know, it's, so it's to do with sort of public receptiveness to stories, I think. So historians can, and, and other disciplines, can mm. produce the raw material, but there's got to be a sort of a public appetite for, for an interest in looking at these people's stories and seeing in some way why they're relevant or significant or interesting. The time has absolutely flown, and whether you're teaching a class or, or chairing an event, there are some times when uh, you wonder how you're going to fill the hour or the two hours, <laughs> and then there are other times when uh, you actually run out of time. But we've had a number of messages and questions coming through, and uh, one thing that's coming up quite a lot, uh, Pauline has mentioned in terms of your, the, the, the research projects both of you led, others, uh, Sinead, Kieran, Dave and others have been asking about the books that they could read to continue this uh, discussion if they want to learn more about some of these areas. What would you recommend? So I'd like to give a shout out to, uh, to our project. So, so I, should, I should make it clear, our, my, our project was a collaboration between myself and Enda Delaney at um, the University of Edinburgh with um, Boston College, the Irish Studies Programme there. And we've, we, we have a big book coming out next May called The Irish Revolution, A Global History. That's going to be published by mm. um, NYU Press. And like a lot of the work from our project, it's got, it's, it's got 13 different historians from different countries. So it's, it's, it's been really about creating a collaborative network. There's also a really good uh, book brought out by History Ireland. It's one of their standalone supplements and it's also called The Global Revolution. Um, so I'd, I'd point readers to those two publications for, for thinking more about the global. Excellent. And then um, well, of course, I have to recommend one of my own books, but only because um, so, so my, my project is on a much smaller scale uh, than, than, than Fergal and his colleagues. Um, and really what it involved was doing a piece of my own research on the violence, which started around 2015. Um, but I, I suppose I've been very interested in collaboration as well and using, you know, the funding, you know, I would say from the Irish Research Council has been absolutely critical for the kind of work I've been, done, been doing and, and also drawing in colleagues around collaboration. And Michael, I think collaboration has been key as well. Perhaps there was less collaboration in the past. Doing edited books can be a pain, but they're really important still. You know, they're less, you know, less impactful for your career. It's the monograph is everything and the journal is, but the Edited collections are still very, very important. So Women and the Irish Revolution, <laughs> Feminism, Activism, Violence, only because, which is edited by me, but only because it has Marie Coleman and Margaret Ward and Louise Ryan and Lucy McDermott, um, John Borganova, Andy Bielenberg. Sorry, I'm running out. Sorry, mm. apologies to the others. Mm. But it does deal, it gives a good overview. And we were very much focusing on opening up new research questions. So I would recommend that. But there's so many. Um, I mentioned Margaret Ward's uh, new book. There, there, there's a number and there's a lot of kind of, you know, biographies coming through. And, you know, there's, there's the, the UCD biography, biography series. Um, so there is an awful lot. Of course, I have to recommend the president of Ireland, um, the president's new uh, Machnaf 100 okay. series, because it's free online. So you can just go online and have a look at that. Um, Fergal, I know you're in the next Machnaf, so you're not in that volume. Um, but myself and a range of others Great are in that. Piece, yeah. so, it's, yeah. so, it's, so that's a really, so again, that democratisation. And I think the, the president, I have to say as well, has really played a huge role mm -hmm. in terms of creating a space 
you know, part of the state, but outside the state as well, where there's a kind of um, a public space to discuss these issues as well. And it gives it leg legitimacy, I think, um, going back to Michael's questions. Yeah. And if you forgive me one more plug, sitting here in the Royal Irish Academy, I'll be in trouble with, with, <laughs> with my publisher if I don't mention it. In a couple of weeks time, we're going to have a book called, uh, and it's a product also of our Global Revolution project, a book called Ireland 1922, Partition, Independence, Civil War. And it's a book uh, with 50 contributors all looking at a particular moment in 1922. And actually, it's a really good example of what we've been talking about this evening because it's looking at the social, the cultural, the economic, the political, the gender and so on. And its view of, of Ireland and how Ireland um, is transformed in 1922 is, is international and global also. So that will be in bookshops uh, around Christmas time. Well, that does bring us to uh, the end of what has been a really illuminating and fascinating discussion. I think a uh, huge thanks to our two uh, brilliant panellists, uh, Professor Linda Connolly and Professor uh, Fergal McGarry, but there's also a wider team that I think deserve huge recognition, uh, led, of course, by uh, wonderful Oral and McBride, but also a uh, person that uh, put, I think, a huge amount of work, Elizabeth McAvoy, in, in, in organising it, to Karen, uh, to the Imagine team, and Peter, who... Uh, helped bring uh, this event to life for an audience uh, all around the country and perhaps further afield and uh, in these times when we can't all meet in person and uh, and perhaps we would have hoped uh, to have had a, a large in-person crowd that I think there is something reassuring and perhaps also inspiring by the fact that uh, we can hold these events and people can can tune in and watch them and I hope uh, people watching at home have enjoyed the discussion uh, but also a huge massive uh, thank you to our two wonderful interpreters Orla and Shelley who have done a brilliant job as usual and I think uh, they do such a, a wonderful job at all of these events and I think what an event like this shows is I really thought when I saw the title that this was going to go in a particular direction. And I think what was so brilliant about our panelists and the way they approached it was it went in a very different direction. And uh, Fergal used the term about revising a framework. And I think that's really what we saw tonight, that we were revising the framework of what we meant by the Irish Revolution in this new world order, that it wasn't just a, a political settlement or wasn't just this one type of creation, it also had huge implications for society, for culture, there was a gender dimension, there was an international and diplomatic dimension, that there's all these extra layers that perhaps as we've said, uh, if this event had been held 30 years ago, it wouldn't have been uh, this type of discussion. Perhaps even 10 years ago, yeah. it wouldn't have been. And, and perhaps that does show the value of some of these commemorative uh, exercises that it encourages new research, it encourages new thinking and new disciplines and new approaches and that by uh, I think uh, the wonderful challenge that the National Archives set in, uh, what can the archives tell us? By posing that question we have come up with some very interesting answers and we've also perhaps asked new questions and more questions and perhaps that's what scholarship is all about so uh, I think uh, uh, our real thanks to our panelists because uh, I think we've ended up asking more questions and, and encouraging people to think about these issues in a new way it's not about closing uh, the issue and saying we're done with that mm -hmm. we're actually perhaps setting a, a research agenda for the next 10 years, perhaps the next 100 years. Uh, so congratulations to you. Thank you to the, uh, the National Archives, the Royal Irish Academy for hosting us, for everyone who's watched. And uh, from everyone here, thank you very much. <laughs>